Hello, my name is Dr. Asley. I'm a board-certified fellowship trained spine surgeon, and I'm the medical director here in the Spine Treatment Center. In this segment, I'll be discussing with you a very hot topic in the world of spine surgery, fusion versus disc replacement. In about 1960s and 70s, um, we could identify damaged disc, a disc that has gone bad, the cushion between the two bones, and therefore causing bone robin and bone and causing severe pain. Uh, we developed surgery called fusion, turning the two bones that are moving against each other and banging that disc, turning into one bone, eliminating motion and eliminating pain. This is an example of a fusion surgery. You can see right here that we've done an anterior and posterior fusion. We've gone through the front, take the disc out, put a prosthesis right in there, and put some pedicle screws and rods to lock it all together. Um, and within the next few months after the surgery, the bone grows between the two bones and these two bones will turn into one bone. This has worked quite well, but of course, the whole concern is that um, if you do fuse at what level, then that puts the pressure on the level above, then that makes the level above deteriorate faster, then on and on and on, then you'll need surgery after surgery after surgery. So the question is, do we have to fuse? Can we not fuse? Can we preserve the motion segment? This is an example of a disc replacement surgery. This is a prosthesis right here that uh, allows motion and uh, you don't have to fuse the bone. But there's a problem with this. As you can see right here, the discs are very fluid in motion. As a matter of fact, uh, a disc has two functions. One is motion, but another as important function is restriction of motion. If you can see right here, this is an anatomy of a normal disc. It's two components, one nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus. So not only this disc actually is cushiony and is soft and causes, is a shock absorber, but at the same time, it causes significant stability and connects the two bones together so you don't have instability. So I have two functions. The problem with these designs that we have is that they replace one function, which is motion, but they don't replace the other function, which is restriction of the function. The way I explain it is that if you see in cars, you have shocks and struts, you have shocks that are springs that are absorb the energy, and you have struts, which are these pistons that restricts the motion. Therefore, if you look at the car, you can see that it runs smooth. If you take the struts out and you got nothing but shocks, you can see these uh, tires that are rattling and pretty uncomfortable ride. Therefore, these new prosthesis that we have, and there are many different companies that manufacture this with different alterations in design, and they do differ a little bit in terms of them, but they all pretty much do the same thing. You have gliding joint with a piece of plastic in the, in the middle. So they don't completely uh, replace the function of a healthy disc. So what's going to happen is that you have this, this motion that is uncontrolled. Um, therefore, what's going to happen throughout the years is that Either the prosthesis get hammered into the bone or the pressure or the function of that stoppage gets transferred to the facet joint and you end up with a facet arthrosis. Therefore, the problems that we have with these new designs of disc replacements is that we just simply don't know how long they last. Now, you factor another problem in the middle, which is human anatomy. You can see in the lumbar spine, we have a huge vein that travels along the lumbar spine. They call it vena cava. It gets the blood vessels from the both legs, forms right here, and it goes up along the lumbar spine. Now, if you've seen this vena cava, this vena cava is very thin and contains a large amount of blood in it. If it gets injured, it's a very catastrophic injury. It could be life-threatening injury. What happens is that when we do the surgery, we push it out of the way and do the disc replacement, take the old disc out, put a piece of prosthesis right here. After that one surgery, because of the surgery, that vena cava scars down. So 
if something happens and if that disc fails, it's a one-way street. You cannot go back and try to move that vein out of the way and get to that disc and uh, turn into fusion because that vein is scarred in and it won't move. Now, in cervical spine, it's a different story. The cervical spine is not here, but in cervical spine, you have esophagus that's in front of the spine. And if you do do a disc replacement in the cervical spine, esophagus is easily moved out of the way and you can go back in there and you can revise it. Therefore, the anatomy between lumbar spine and cervical spine is very different. Another factor that comes in is that how much pressure gets transferred. In the cervical spine, you have the weight of the head. In the lumbar spine, you have the weight of the entire torso and the upper body. Therefore, the pressures that goes through these discs at the interface of the prosthesis of bone is very great in the lumbar spine and not as bad in the cervical spine. Therefore, based on papers that are coming out recently and the human anatomy, at this time, I believe we should be very cautious in terms of doing a lumbar disc replacement. However, we have a better chance of using this replacement in the cervical spine. As a matter of fact, in the cervical spine, a disc replacement that we have is a God-given gift uh, because uh, we have these patients like in late 20s or early 30s that got into a car accident and they have a herniated disc. In those patients, we don't want to fuse them at that young age. Uh, however, the disc replacement, this, the, this technology that we have, now we have an answer for that young population that we can go in and clean the disc out and put a piece of prosthesis in there. And, and that's a God-given gift in that subpopulation. Therefore, at this time, we at Sacramento Spine Treatment Center, we do endorse uh, disc replacement in the cervical spine, but we are very, very cautious for disc replacement in the lumbar spine. Now, as we've discussed in our, um, in our previous videos, in Spine Treatment Center, we keep our lectures very fresh and up to date. Uh, lately, there's been some research coming out to look at the disc replacement in the lumbar and cervical spine. And these, there are two types of research that are being done. One by people who do the disc replacement, they have connection to the company who makes the disc. And the other group are independent people, independent observers that are looking down as an independent viewer to see the results. The results that are coming out with the group that they're doing these disc replacements and uh, they have connection to the company, they're saying it worked great, it's a beautiful thing. And the other group saying that it's not doing anything what it was supposed, it's not doing what it was supposed to do. It was not, it's not doing what it was advertised to do, which is basically slowing down the progression of disease process on the disc above and below. And I have an explanation for it. And that's very complex. I need you to stay with me on this. Now, not all discs have the same quality. After all, you've got to understand that uh, we're just understanding that the term degenerative disc disease is not true anymore. We should actually change the name to damaged disc disease. I truly identify as disc that's gone bad on a broad category into two categories. One is traumatic, one is true degeneration. At one end, you have this disc that um, the quality is not very good, um, starts early in life, even 17 or 18 years old. You have multi-levels that are involved. That patient has sibling, a parent that has back problems, or, or, or a relative, um, and they start having symptomatic early. On the other hand, you have this healthy guy that has perfectly looking discs, except one disc, and if you talk to him, um, he will tell you that about 10 years before or eight years before, or sometimes when they were young, they either got into a car accident or, um, or they fell off a horse or, or dove into the pool. And if you look back, they can always, they can sometimes, or sometimes you don't remember, um, they can pinpoint it, an incident in their back. And those are the people that actually have traumatic origin of their disc disease. Those are the people that they have damaged disc disease. After all, we now we, um, realize, we learn that the integrity of the disc is very important. It's like a tire. 
Some people are saying even if you put a needle in it, it starts deflating within the year. So what happens is that people get into an accident, they hurt for about a few days, and then the pain gets better, better because the tissue is so nice and healthy. What happens, like 10 years go by, 10 years later, they could be doing something, and it gets aggravated, they end up being with pain. But what happens is that the, the, the process, the damaged process, the damaging process started 10 years ago. Now, this is what I'm predicting. What I am predicting is that independent research after research is going to come out and say, the disc replacement is not doing what it was advertising to do, which is stopping the progression at a disc above and below. And I have an answer for that. This is the understanding. Uh, you have two, um, two poles of the disc spectrum. One is the disc that's damaged, one is the disc that's healthy, and everything in the middle. Okay? Now, if you do disc replacement, in the healthy section, they're going to stay healthy. The disc above and below is not going to deteriorate any further. If you do disc replacement in the degenerative segment, no matter what you do, they're going to continue to degenerate. I believe there's a 10 to 15 percent population in the middle that it does matter if you do fusion versus um, disc replacement. However, we don't know who they are, and because their population is a small, only 10 to 15 percent, they're always going to be hidden in the bigger population. Therefore, I'm predicting that we're going to have research after research coming out saying that the disc is not working. But it's not working because we're not doing it in the right population. Therefore, I believe that the uh, spine surgery, the world of spine surgery, needs to look at the disease process first and find out why the disc deteriorated. And then, trying to figure out if a treatment is working for it or not. The example that I give you is this. Let's say you're traveling down the freeway and, and you have a flat tire. You take your car to a tire shop. What's the first question you ask? Well, how much is it? That's fine. But what's the second question you ask? You say, what, what, what happened? It's important. Why? Because if um, something came and punctured your, your tire, and the rest of your tires are fine and healthy, then you don't have to worry about a thing because that's the, that was a problem that got fixed and you're good to go. But if that tire was defective and unraveled, then you have to worry about all the other tires. Then if you can't fix the other tires, you don't have the money to do it like we, in, our, in, our, in our body, we can't, disc all of, we can't change all of the discs. Then you have to be careful and you shouldn't drive very fast. And that's where we stand right now. I know it's a very complex topic. It took me years to have even a grasp of understanding of this process. And if you have questions, just let me know. Have a nice day.